Good evening, friends, and welcome again to Prophecy Odyssey, coming to you live here from New York City, Midtown Manhattan, just down the block from the Empire State Building. I want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and literally around the world. We want to welcome our local folks right here in the city for coming out. Uh, we've started an in-depth Bible prophecy seminar, and tonight is night number three of this series. We have a very important subject that we're going to be talking about. But before we get to the subject, I want to thank those watching around the world that have reached out and contacted Amazing Facts. And we want to send greetings to a few of those who have reached out to us. We have a group of people that are watching in the Philippines. We want to greet you. Also in eastern Zambia, there is a group watching in eastern Zambia. In Nairobi, Kenya, we want to greet those in Kenya. Those watching in Queensland, Australia. Those watching in Sofia, Bulgaria. And we also have a group that is watching in Poland. Now, as I mentioned before, we are translating these programs into many different languages. We're using AI. We have about 17 languages that we have translated these meetings into. The people that contacted us from Poland, they said they're watching these meetings. They're watching Pastor Doug speak Polish, and they follow along with the meeting. So I thought it might be nice. Do you want to see what Pastor Doug looks like speaking Polish? All right, so we're going to play a little video clip if they got that ready. Here is Pastor Doug speaking Polish. All right, well, there you got it. It was more than Polish. He had Italian and Chinese, and of course, that's not all the languages. Uh, that is the gift of tongues with a little AI twist, but it works, right? We're getting the message out to the world, and so that is exciting. I want to remind you about the materials that's available for this seminar. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the arch villain. That's lesson number three. If you don't have the lesson, you can just go to the Prophecy Odyssey website. You can download the lesson right there. Also, we have a free offer for those of you who are watching. We've got one of our amazing fact sharing magazines, one of our prophecy magazines. It's called Cosmic Conflict. A lot of people are wondering, well, if God is good, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? Well, this magazine gives the important Bible facts about why we have suffering. If you'd like to receive this, all you need to do is text the word COSMIC24 to the number 40544. If you're in North America, you'll receive a digital download of the magazine. You can also just go to the website, prophecyodyssey.com, and you'll be able to order the magazine. We'll send it to you for free. Read it and share it with somebody else. And for those of you who are here, you will receive yours as you leave again this evening. And once again, read it, share it with somebody else. It's a great sharing resource. Well, we've got a theme song that we've been singing every night. And I know you have practiced it once. And I hope our friends watching from home or wherever you might be, that you're going to sing along with us. I'd like to invite our musicians. Let's stand as we sing together our theme song this evening. God always thinks about us for good and hope and peace to bring us to our future home where time will never cease. He wants for us to know Him, to call upon His name. He gave His one and His ears are ever waiting, listening for our plea, His Spirit to renew our lives and truth to set us free. His kingdom and His righteousness must be our only goal, to seek for God with all our Why 
while you're still standing, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our gracious God and our Father, thank you for this day that you have gifted to us. Thank you for another day of life and for all of its intended blessings. Tonight we pray for your presence in our midst. We invoke your presence and pray that you may come into this place and to teach us and lead us and convict us and convince us of your righteousness. We thank you for the ministry, the pulpit witness of Pastor Doug and his team. We pray that you may use him again tonight mightily. As we study your word, may we be drawn close to you. May hearts be changed and transformed for eternity. And, O oh God, it is our prayer that at the end of this evening, when all of the blessings would have come our way, we'll be mindful to give you all praise, honor, and glory. For we pray this prayer in the matchless name of Jesus, our Lord, and our soon-coming King. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Pastor Jules. This is a team effort. There's a lot that's been happening behind the scenes, and we really appreciate the support that we have of a number of churches here in New York. So we do appreciate that. Well, at this time, we have a beautiful musical item that's going to be brought to us by Marguerite and, and John and Kelly on the piano. I will serve thee. me. 
Amen. Thank you, John, Marguerite, and Kelly. What a joy to have people that use their gifts to glorify God. Amen. We really appreciate everything our musicians have done. Tonight, it's time for your Bible questions. And we want to remind you, if you haven't yet submitted a Bible question, it's easy to do. For those of you who are watching online, we're going to put up a QR code on the screen. And all you need to do is scan that QR code with your phone. It'll take you to a site. You don't have to register or log in or anything like that. You can just type your Bible question right there. And uh, the last I heard, we've got hundreds of questions that have already been submitted. Um, we're trying to gather these questions together in different categories. And Pastor Doug is going to answer as many of them as possible. Of course, the same thing for those of you who are here. Just scan the code that you see, and you can type in your Bible question. Well, at this time... Why don't you join me as we warmly welcome Pastor Doug and Karen as they bring Bible questions this evening. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross, and welcome, everybody, once again to the Prophecy Odyssey meetings. This is an industrial strength Bible prophecy program, and we're going to do everything we can to teach the foundational themes of Scripture in the context of Bible prophecy. Uh, part of that is we're taking Bible questions from all across the spectrum. A Bible prophecy begins in Genesis and goes to Revelation, and there's a lot of other questions in between. And so I want to welcome again those who are watching on 3ABN and Hope International, Amazing Facts, and Roku and YouTube, and all of you who have come here in New York City. God bless you. This is Bachelor. How well, are you doing? It's nice to see you tonight. You look nice and <laughs> Thank purple. You too. All right. Our first question. What is the best way to study the Bible? Yeah, we put that in a very good practical question. I remember the first time I started reading the Bible and I happened to run into a King James Bible and we didn't study King James English in PS 87. And so you know, every time I got to the word brethren, I thought it was breathing. And I thought, well, there's a lot of breathing in the book of Acts. Must be a spiritual term. So I didn't know where to start, and I started in Genesis to try to, you know, beginning of the book. I got bogged down a little bit with the construction of the sanctuary in Exodus, and someone told me, go to the New Testament, read about Jesus. And so I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That transformed my life, the teachings of Jesus. And then since then, you know, I've gone back, and as I read the Old Testament, it all began to make a lot more sense. Uh, and you may want to, you know, the, we're teaching here from the New King James Version. It's got the classic arrangement of the King James Version, but uh, a little more modern terms. As someone said, reading the Bible is like picking apples from a tree. First you shake the whole tree, and then you shake the limbs, and then the branches, and then you look behind every twig. You will never reach the bottom of Bible study. There is so much here. It's like trying to find the depths of the mind of God. And so, wherever you start, don't be discouraged if you don't understand anything. How many of you are aware that when you were babies, you had no idea what your parents were saying to you? <laughs> How, some of you still have no idea what your parents are saying to you, right? But you know what I mean. Eventually, you start to learn, and the Bible is a language your Heavenly Father will speak to you. Keep reading you will understand more and more, I promise. And you can also do a chronological Bible. Sometimes doing a chronological Bible is really nice because it puts all of the Old Testament together. So Chronicles and Kings go hand in hand. Um, I like to read, take a small book in the New Testament like James or, or um, Thessalonians or the Timothys and just spend like two or three weeks, maybe even a month, just reading the same mm -hmm. book. And then the more you read it, the more you start connecting words with words and looking up words like light in different places. And it just really helps to expand your understanding of what is the, going this on. This is the difference between someone who grew up going to church, she's you know, Thessalonians, someone who grew up not knowing anything about the Bible. <laughs> Timoth so she second, wants Timothy, to get a little deeper. Galatians, yeah. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, those are all wonderful books. <laughs> all right, our next question. In Luke 17, 26 to 30, it says, just like during Noah's time, everyone will be going along their merry way when Jesus returns. But in Revelation, it talks about all kinds of turmoil, plagues, bowls, and judgment. Which one is it? Yeah, that is a great question. 
You know, you read some of the scriptures that talk about the end of the world and it just sounds like apocalyptic nuclear meltdown everywhere all at once. And then you read other places and Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, this is in Luke chapter 17, they were building and they were planting. They were buying and they were selling. They were marrying and giving in marriage, meaning making marriage arrangements. In other words, they thought they had plenty of time to make plans for the future and boom, it came upon them. It's actually a combination of both because when you read in Revelation about the seven last plagues and you, it'll come later, but they're really two times of trouble. You've got a time of trouble in Revelation where people just can't buy or sell and then it transitions into a death decree and the seven last plagues. Uh, so, you know, during the t small time of trouble, God's people are still going to be out there trying to share the truth. When the seven last plagues come, they're not universal all, all over the world all at the same time. One of the plagues, people being scorched with great heat, probably not going to be as bad in, you know, the South Pole as it's going to be at the equator. And so, in some degree, life will be going on, but you're going to see things are getting worse and worse everywhere. So that's why you don't want to wait until you think that, oh, well, I can see it's coming because Jesus said, in such an hour that you think not, the Son of Man is coming. Be ready always. How many of you, well, you don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> you wait until April before you file your taxes. Me? You don't, you got to wait till the last minute. God doesn't want us to wait till the last minute. He wants us to be ready. Amen. Amen. Pastor Doug, if God wants to save everyone, why does it say in Matthew 24 that the very elect may be deceived? Yeah, well, the deceptions in Matthew 24, Jesus said that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. The reason the very elect are not deceived is because we're measuring what the beast power is saying by what the Word of God says, so we are not being deceived. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 8, Verse 20, according to the law and the testimony, that means the law and the prophets, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so and that's why we're having this seminar, not only for you here, but people watching around the world. We do not want people to be deceived. The Lord says, if we search for him, we'll find him. It's like our theme song, right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't want anyone to be lost, but he wants to be wanted. You have to seek if you're going to find. Isn't that what Jesus said? So many will be lost because they're indifferent. The Bible tells us in Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they reject knowledge. They don't even want to know. They're not interested. So as desperately as the Lord wants to save them, you've got to seek, you've got to want, and you won't be deceived if you do search for him and fill your heart with God's word. And you're going to talk about this more in another lesson. Yeah, we've got... Some of the questions we're actually just kind of pushing aside because we know the subject is coming later. You are using AI to share the message. I don't know much about AI, but it seems evil. It seems like people that create AI are playing God. Am I wrong? Well, AI is a very interesting uh, technology. Let me give you, a, this is important, so listen carefully. Technology in itself is, is usually not moral good or bad. When Gutenberg invented the printing press, that was new technology for communication. First book printed was a Bible. Wonderful. How many of you are glad you got printed Bibles? Amen. Are you aware that up until that time, every Bible was written by a man's hand? The scribes were saying that Gutenberg's machine created Bible was evil because there was no soul in the Bible. Well, we laugh at that now. When the technology of radio came around, it's a technology for communicating audio information. You can use it for teaching terrible things. You can use it for bad music. You can use it for broadcasting the gospel and good music. It is a technology. Television. Most of what's on television or in the theater it's probably not good for Christians just because the world is, you know, captivated by that which is evil, right? But it's a communication technology. You can watch, you know, a lot of these violent programs. You can watch The Bachelorette 
or you can watch the Doug and Karen Bachelor. That's right. And then that's okay. So the I can use bachelors. <laughs> so you, you, I mean, you can use the technology for good or for evil. AI. I am so thankful when I'm lost and I type into Google Maps, how do I get home? It tells me. Hey, come on now, who will fess up? That you're thankful. It's a technology. Can it be used for evil? Yes. The internet. We're broadcasting the gospel right now on the internet, and we also know that there are evil things that are broadcast on the internet. Mm -hmm. So AI is a little different in that the power of it is quite fantastic, and it, it's accelerating exponentially all the time. We don't know exactly where it's going to lead, but that doesn't mean the technology is of itself evil. The problem with technology is people create it, and there are good people and bad people, and it can be used both ways. So just be careful. You can make a nuclear reactor to make power for a city or blow up a city with a nuclear bomb. How can we convince people that Daniel 2 is the truth? People out there are skeptical these days. Well, it's not in the Bible, but Mark Twain said, a person convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. If a person is open and honest, I, I always say, boy, if I can talk to an honest person and show them the scriptures, I believe I can persuade them that the Bible is the word of God and a supernatural book. Because, y'all, I'm from New York City, and there's a lot of games out there, a lot of bamboozling, a lot of con artists. And when I first started hearing about Christianity, I said, nah, I didn't believe it. I needed persuading. I needed evidence on which to base my faith. If a person is honest, there is an abundance of dependable evidence that the Bible is a supernatural book. Amen. And my faith now is based on evidence. We gave you evidence in the presentation last night that Daniel foretold, wrote it in advance, foretold the major kingdoms of the world mm -hmm. that would uh, be occupying God's people and how it would spread, and it all happened just as foretold. And we haven't even begun to touch the surface of all the prophecies we're going to get into. Why did God give all the prophecies and details in Daniel and Revelation if he doesn't want us to know the day and the hour of his coming? Well, the Lord, he wants us to be ready. He doesn't want us to get ready just because we're afraid of the end. He wants us to live lives of service. You know, as a pastor, every now and then I meet somebody and, and they assume that like the thief on the cross that came to Jesus in the last hours of his life, they said, well, I'm going to live for the devil, have a good time, and then before I die, I'll repent and I'll be saved. That's kind of like saying, I'm going to take a rose and wait until all the petals fall off and then give it to God. Don't say, I'm going to use up my life for the devil and then give the remains to God. Now, God often accepts people at the last hour, but not usually the ones who plan on doing it that way. There's only one example in the Bible of a deathbed conversion, so nobody needs to lose hope. But there's only one example of a deathbed conversion, so nobody will dare to presume. Amen. And so he wants us to love him. He said, I'm not going to tell you the day or hour. Did I ask you a minute ago how many wait to the last minute to get their taxes ready? Some people, if you knew the day and the hour of the Lord's coming, you'd wait until 24 hours before and then you'd decide to repent. Right? He wants us to love Him and know Him now. It is better to serve the Lord with your strength and your youth and your energy. Don't give God the leftovers and give the rest of your life to the devil. God has a good plan for you. By the way, you will have a more abundant life serving the Lord now. Amen. Some people think you can't have any fun as a Christian. I have so much more fun now as a Christian than I ever had in the world. So don't believe the devil's lie. All right. So we want to put up that QR code again for you at home or here, and you would like to send in a question or a prayer request, you can scan that QR code, and then you will be able to submit your question. We're so thankful for all your questions. And now we're going to have a musical selection brought to us by our musical team, Kelly, John, and Marguerite. And I just wanted to say one thing special. My dear friend Kelly um, was with us 25 years ago when we did our Net 99 program, a Millennium of Prophecy. And she's been able to be with us this opening weekend, but this will be her last evening. And we just want to thank you for your friendship and your working with us. So please enjoy our song, It Amen. Is Well With Your Soul. Attending my way 
Welcome, friends, once again to the Prophecy Odyssey program. We are so thankful to be here with you in New York City. And we know there's a lot going on right now. I understand they've got the UN General Council in session. And you folks, some of you had to brave the traffic to come. We sure appreciate your faithful attendance. It means so much to us. And, and those of you who are watching online, and we know that we've got groups that are watching around the world that are tuning in with us. In fact, I think that uh, we've even got a little picture here of one of the groups that's watching at our home church back in California. This is the uh, Granite Bay Hilltop Church. Uh, they're faithfully gathering together, not just watching in their homes, but they had about 42 people there that were tuning in. And we want to remind you 
Uh, we know we've got groups that are watching in New Guinea, in Australia, in India, in China, Hong Kong, all over the world. If you send us a picture of your group, some have sent pictures of their home groups that are meeting together, home Bible study groups, we're going to put some of them up on the screen just to keep the sense that this is an international family Bible study. Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, those of you in New York, why don't you wave for a second? Just tell all the friends, they're going to get camera. Tell them you're part of the family and that we're all watching together. Amen. This is a wonderful thing when you think about it, just an international event. And tonight's study is going to be a very important subject. We're going to be talking about the arch villain of prophecy. And I think you probably know who that is. And, you know, whenever I present this subject, I do it with much prayer because the adversary, I can promise you, is not happy that we're exposing his tactics. But I know that there are people around the world that are hedging in this entire event with prayer. The Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps round about those that serve him and delivers him. And the devil was mad at the Lord. He says, you... You've set a hedge about Job. And we're praying that God will just hedge in this whole series with his protection because we're going to tell you what the devil's up to. He appears all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And the battle between good and evil is one of the central battles that you're going to find in the books of prophecy. So you need to understand the enemy and what you're up against. I don't like to focus on the devil. I don't spend an inordinate amount of time talking about it, but Jesus talked about the devil, so we must to understand his tactics. Paul said we do not want to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Well, we always like to start with an amazing fact. And you know, I don't think I ever did mention that you might wonder, what is amazing facts and where'd you come from? Amazing Facts has been around now over 65 years. Started with a 15-minute radio program that began with an amazing fact from science or from history or from nature. And then we would weave in spiritual biblical truth. And it just became very popular and grew from radio to television to Bible school to mission training. And we've got mission training schools around the world and, and broadcast. And God just has been blessing. Ministry has been going by faith for over 65 years now. Well, we just like amazing facts, and I love amazing facts. Well, we're going to start with one about the octopus. Now, Karen and I, we, we have our scuba license, and we like to dive. We were diving off of Egypt a couple of years ago, and, and the octopus is an amazing creature. It's among the most flexible and versatile and clever, very intelligent. They say its intelligence level is on the same level as a dog. When it comes to disguise, an octopus is the ultimate chameleon. Thanks to special cells in its skin, it's not only able to change the color in just a flash of a moment, but it can change the texture of its skin so it can suddenly look like a rock on the seafloor or appear like the coral where it's hiding. There's an octopus in that picture. That octopus that you're looking at, if he wants, he can turn purple or red and he can look... They can change and look like a crab walking. They can look like a fish swimming. They can even make themselves look like a sea snake. They are so clever. They will find an empty clam shell. They'll get inside the clam shell. They'll open and close the clam shell and stick one little tentacle out like a worm to lure fish over, and then they pounce. They have a famous way of people put them in aquariums of escaping from the aquariums. They're incredible. And if they're being pursued by a predator, They'll let out a blast of ink and then jet off in another direction, leaving their predator totally bewildered and confused. No, I have nothing against octopus, but it makes me think about the devil, who is a master deceiver. And uh, through history, the devil has also inspired and possessed individuals that have deceived. Jesus said, in the last days there will be false Christs. Jesus came into the world to show us what God is like. It's called the incarnation. God became a man. Before the second coming, the devil is going to come and impersonate Christ and deceive much of the world. We need to know how to spot him and recognize his devices. 
Another little fact of history, some of you maybe have heard of Grigory Rasputin. You know, for years the Russian family, the Tsar Alexander, and for generations back they ruled Russia with the imperial family. And there was this peasant born in Siberia, very clever, and uh, he became something of a mystic quasi-priest. He went to St. Petersburg, and he sort of wormed his way into the upper echelons, a very clever, manipulating man, very charismatic. He finally said that he believed he could heal Tsar Alexander's son Alexei that was a hemophiliac. And they brought him into the palace, and it seemed like his advice when followed was helping the boy. He eventually wormed his way into the royal court and began to manipulate the family, especially the Tsar's wife, some accuse him of having a, uh, an affair, but that was never proven. And started encouraging military decisions. And the advice was just awful. And finally, the imperial family disintegrated. Communism took over. They were assassinated, and so was Rasputin. Historians look back and say they call him the mad monk. Because of the evil influence of this mad monk, the whole kingdom was lost. And the devil is a master manipulator. Now, before we go to our lesson, we like to go out and just talk to people on the streets and ask, if there's a good God, then why is there so much evil in the world? And a couple of other questions. So let's take a listen to what our people on the street have to say. I believe that there's evil in the world because so many people are looking to fill the hole in their heart with things that are not sustainable like how Jesus Christ is sustainable. Maybe it has to do with your upbringing? Well, because people are not uh, looking for God. They don't have God in their lives. It's human nature, I guess. Oh, that's a trick question. Yes. <laughs> uh, probably not in the traditional sense. Probably, probably not how most people believe in the devil. I think there's a balance of bad and good in the world. No. Maybe the presence of Satan is a kind of way to, like, guide people away from him. Mm, but I think, you know, maybe he needs him. To, to know the difference between the good thing and the bad thing. And... You know, I've had that same thought myself, along with other thoughts. But, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Wow, that's a very good question. I don't know. I think it's far more, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I don't know if I can answer that, that question, you know. I think do get out three or four rounds, probably, uh, I don't know. I, I honestly don't have an answer to that. Well, there you have it. One thing is perfectly clear is that people are not perfectly clear <laughs> on whether or not there is a devil. And if there is a devil, why would God make a devil? And if God's more powerful than the devil, is God evil in allowing the devil to do evil? How many of you have thought these things or wondered or heard these questions before? You just think about it. If God is love, if God is good, if God is all-powerful, then why is there so much suffering and evil in the world? This is one of the most important questions that we need to understand. And if you pay attention and study the lesson tonight, you're going to have the most important answers. And also, don't forget the free offer magazine called Cosmic Conflict. Why is there evil in the world today if God is good and he is a loving God? Well, to get the answer to that, we need to go to the questions. We're going to go to the Bible. And these lessons, of course, we're on lesson number three tonight, talking about this arch villain. And we're going to begin with question number one. The Bible says God did not make a devil. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. According to James, God is good, good. Jesus said, God is good. In the beginning when he made the world, said it was good, and he saw that it was good, and it was good, and it was very good. The word God comes from, it's derived from the word good, the goodness of God. And why would a good God make a bad devil? He didn't. He made a good angel. You can read about this in a few principal passages. If you look in your Bible in Isaiah chapter 14, how you are fallen from heaven, O, and don't forget, you here in New York, if you see the answers there in teal, we want you to call them out. That's what it will go in. The answers are given to you. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, 
son of the morning. Uh, when you say the word loose, it means light. Some of you have heard of lucite, a luminescence. It's talking about light. He was a glorious morning star, a bright angel. God made a beautiful angel, the most powerful of his created intelligent beings, was this mighty general, this angel that we know as Lucifer. If you had known him back then, you would have liked him. The other angels loved him. Some people like him the way he is today. But uh, God didn't make anything evil. You know, I think it's probably a good idea. I always like to start by turning to the book itself. If you have your Bibles or on your phones, you at home, hopefully you have Bibles at your fingertips, turn to Isaiah chapter 14. The principal passages where you're going to find information about the devil that goes back in time is Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Revelation chapter 12, and a few other places. But we're going to go to Isaiah 14. We'll start with verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. You see, Jesus said, I saw Satan cast from heaven. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, I mean the, the heights. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wanted God's position. Yet God says, you will be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. He wanted to exalt himself higher and higher and higher. And if you have your Bibles, you may just turn quickly to Ezekiel 28. And we'll start reading here in verse 14. And then we'll get to the lessons here. It says, you were the anointed cherub. How many of you remember, you've probably seen images even in the movies, what they call the Ark of the Covenant. It's this golden box that had the Ten Commandments. On the top, they called it the mercy seat. And the Shekinah glory of God would appear to Moses and the high priest between these two golden cherub angels. Now, they were golden angels. In heaven, God has real angels. You read in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple, and on the right and on the left, there are these cherubim, and they're saying these seraphim, and they're saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of God. The Lord Almighty is flanked by these two mighty beings. Lucifer held the highest position. Ezekiel's reminding us of that. You are the anointed cherub who covers, one of the covering angels. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect. You were what? You were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created. He wasn't born. Angels aren't born. Jesus said they don't marry or give in marriage. They're created. Until iniquity was found in you. Now, we'll, we'll go to some other passages a little later on, but I just wanted that as a background for where we're going. All right, going back to our question number one, second part. Lucifer was his name. You know, just quick story. I, I was doing, I was on the road doing meetings like this and doing my own laundry and so thankful Karen's with me now to help with that in this trip. <laughs> and I'm in a laundromat and I'm watching clothes dry, which is not a lot more exciting than watching paint dry. And, and there was another boy there. His mother was off folding clothes and he was playing with some toy on the floor. And so I just struck up a conversation with him and I said, hey, what's your name? Without even looking up, he said, Lucifer. And I thought, well, you didn't go to church, do you? I didn't say that. <laughs> I just thought that. I mean, you know, how many people do you know, like, they named their kid Judas or, or Lucifer, or they named their daughter Jezebel. You don't, you know, that's what you name. You name your Doberman pitcher Lucifer, right? <laughs> so, but the name originally was a good name. But now he's known as Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, Apollyon, the dragon. The Bible has several names for Lucifer now, and they're not good. Second part, Isaiah 14, verse 13 and 14. For you said in your, what? 
said, in your heart, I will be like the Most High. He wanted God's position. The devil became jealous that he did not have the same power of Christ to create, and he wanted to take that from him. And so uh, it says, your heart was lifted up because of your what? Your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Here he depicts this beautiful, splendid being. Now, we've been here three nights. I hope you trust me. Would you trust me for just a moment? I want, to, I want you to just imagine something, but you're going to have to close your eyes to imagine this. So, so for just, I promise I won't do anything to you. No hypnosis, just trust me. Close your eyes for just a moment, and I want you to picture, what do you see when you think of the devil? All right, now you can open your eyes. What did you see? Huh? Yeah. What do people usually see when they think of the devil? How many of you will admit you saw something red? Fess up, all right. How many saw a pitchfork? That ostensibly is so he can keep people evenly cooked in Hades, right? How many saw a creature with a goatee in your minds? Bat wings, anybody? Red circus leotards? You know, I grew a goatee a few years ago, back when my hair before it turned gray. And somebody said, Doug, you can't do what you do with a goatee. He said, you look like the devil. I said, well, what makes you think he's got a goatee? Where in the Bible does it say he's got a goatee? They said, I don't know, but you look like a sinister minister. You need to, <laughs> you need to get rid of that. And Karen tells me to shave it off. But isn't, you know, you talk about red devil paint or other people say devil's food cake. And if you look at this, these modern concepts of the devil, this is what people think of. They think of some ghoulish creature that is, you know, like a, a goblin and, and hideous looking and scary. But what does he really look like according to the Bible? You know, the Bible tells us that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, do not be surprised for Satan himself can be transformed into an angel of light. The devil to think that he's this medieval ghoulish creature but in reality he can impersonate Christ and he often comes as a creature of light and a creature of glory so the devil it, the Bible says he was beautiful he was splendid he just assumed that he you think of him in terms of this terrifying ugly creature in reality in the last days, he's going to appear as people's modern concept of Jesus around the world, performing miracles, quoting some of the scripture, and much of the world is going to be deceived. Revelation tw chapter 12 says, who deceiveth the whole world. If he looked like that guy in red leotards with the pitchfork and the horns, would he deceive anybody? Who's going to listen to that? All right, get back to our lesson. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor he was a splendid being so did God make a devil when he created Lucifer no Bible says you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you now I, I want you to think about something for a minute I, I think everybody here will agree with me that we want love I don't know about you, I mean, I don't want to sound too self-centered, but if I had a choice, I prefer to be liked as opposed to being unliked. Uh, you ask any girl when she's courting, she wants to be wanted. How many will admit that? Some of you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. You, 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 <laughs> you want to be wanted, that's a sin. <laughs> you want to be wanted, boys want to be wanted, everyone wants to be wanted, God wants us to want Him. Right? We all want love. Why didn't God make Lucifer where there was no bad transistors? Obviously, does God know everything? Did God know that someday Lucifer was going to go bad? If he knows everything, yeah. Then why did he make him? 
So, so people start blaming God. Now let me explain how this, this once you get this, light's going to go on. Can you make somebody love? AI can do anything. I've discovered recently, I'm probably the last one who's discovered it, they got this program now called Chat GDP where you just give it a few cues and it'll write a letter for you. So I would like a love letter. And so I, I turn on my Chat GDP and I say, please compose a love letter for me talking about Doug, how intelligent and beautiful and handsome and irresistible he is. <laughs> Wait for it. Okay, you ready? Yes. Dear Doug, I hope this letter finds you well. I wanted to take a moment to express just how much you mean to me and how deeply I appreciate everything about you. First and foremost, your beauty is something that never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> Whether, I didn't write this honest, chat GDP. Whether it is the sparkle in your eyes or the warmth of your smile. Karen, you ought to use this next time. <laughs> or the way you carry yourself with such grace and confidence. A and it's true too, yeah. And you are truly a sight to behold. Your presence lights up any room, and I feel incredibly lucky to be able to witness your beauty every day. Beyond your physical appearance and your wisdom is something I deeply admire. You have a way of seeing the world that is both insightful and inspiring. Your advice has guided me through many of tough times, and your perspective always helps me see things in a new light. I am constantly learning from you, and I am grateful for the wisdom you share so generously. Your sense of humor is another quality I cherish. You have an incredible ability to make me laugh, even during the darkest days. Your jokes and your playful banter and your infectious laughter bring me so much joy. I love how we can share moments of silliness and fun, making every day a little brighter. And then there's your physical strength, whether it's helping out with heavy lifting, <laughs> or tackling challenges, or simply being there to offer strong and comforting embrace. Your strength is something I deeply appreciate. It's not just about you, the physical aspect, but all the strength of your character and the way you stand by me through thick and thin. Doug, you are an extraordinary person. I'm so grateful to have you in my life. Your beauty, wisdom, humor, and strength make you truly one of a kind. Thank you for being you and for sharing your wonderful self with me. After reading that, I think I'm going to leave Karen and run off with my phone. <laughs> it's been good, dear, all these years, but I've never had this kind of appreciation before. <laughs> so let me ask you, while I find this entertaining, do I think for a moment that my phone loves me like Karen? It is telling me what it was programmed to say. That is not love. God cannot pre-program his intelligent creatures to love. He gives them freedom. The greatest proof he gives that freedom is the evil in the world today. And that's why he doesn't just destroy the devil. He wants our love. Now he knows whether or not we're going to love him. He knows because he knows everything. But you still have freedom to choose. And God, God values real love so much that he even took the risk to make a creature that would process in his own mind that he chose to love himself more than God. And that's what's caused all the problem in the universe is the devil's self-love. You see, God created his creatures for love to go out. What's a great commandment? Love the Lord, love your neighbor, and lastly, as you love yourself. The devil, the compass needle broke. It's love yourself first. And all of us have got a broken compass needle. We're all, without salvation and the Holy Spirit, we're selfish creatures. And Jesus came. He was motivated by the love of God. It was a love to give, a love that went out. And he wants to give us that love. Lucifer, you notice what he wanted? He wanted God's position. 
You find the word pride, you find the word Lucifer, you find the word sin, and at the middle of all those words, what do you find? The letter I. I, I, I. The devil had eye problems. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit. I. You know, they say people that are struggling with insanity use the words I, me, my, mine, and myself five times more than sane people. Selfishness is a form of insanity, and you will self-destruct. God did not make us to live unto ourselves. He made us to learn to love and to give and to think of others. It is more blessed, Jesus said, to give than receive. The devil's whole wiring is broken. And when Adam and Eve chose to listen to the devil instead of God, we ended up with the same problem. Question number three, what finally happened to Lucifer? Well, as he began to resent that he was not God, that he did not have the power that God had, he began to sow seeds of discord among the other angels in heaven. And he started saying, you know, God doesn't give us freedom. We don't need God's laws to guide us. We are intelligent creatures. We don't need to rule one God. I'm just as powerful as God. We could also worship me. And he was able, like uh, the best politician ever, to persuade one-third of the angels to follow him until finally, and God's very patient. We don't know how long this dispute transpired, but eventually there was a war that broke out in heaven. And you read here in Revelation 12, verse 7, and war broke out where? You usually don't think of heaven and war together, do you? Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And Michael is a symbolic name. And the dragon is his symbolic name. And his angels fought. And the Bible says ultimately they are cast out. Number four, what powerful beings work under the devil's command? We just reference that. It says his tail. Speaking of this dragon, as a matter of fact, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Let's read this quickly so that you get it in context and we'll have covered the three principal passages that you find. And remember, we're studying prophecy. If you read in Revelation 12, verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So that great dragon was cast out. Now who's the great dragon? That serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Who's the dragon? Do we have to guess? It's the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. Even Jesus said the devil is the prince of this world. And his angels were cast out with him. All right, so a lot of times when people are saying, well, there was a ghost that was spooking me. It's not a ghost. It's fallen angels. Sometimes we call them goblins and demons and evil spirits, and the Bible talks about them in the New and the Old Testament. There's not only a battle between Christ and Satan, there's a battle between the good angels and the bad angels. And you've probably all seen cartoons, and there's a certain amount of truth to it, where they got the good angel with a halo on one wing, and he's saying, do what's right. Then you got the bad angel on the other side, he's no, do what's bad. And it's really our conscience. It's the Holy Spirit and the devil tempting so it's a very real battle we face every day. His angels were cast out with him. Not, I'm sorry, yeah, Revelation 12, verse 9, his angels were cast out with him. Question number five, what methods, we need to be aware of how the devil operates, what methods does Satan use in his work? Well, there's several things. Point number A, it's Satan who deceives the whole world. Now, deception is different from just a blatant lie. Deception is the commingling of truth with error. Never is the devil more dangerous than he'll take something that is 85% true. Do you know that all religions have elements of truth? But then the devil mixes in 15% or 5% of poison. And he attracts, how do you catch a fish? You take a good piece of bait and you put a hook in it. Nothing wrong with the bait, it's the hook in it. And so the devil, he'll take something good, but he'll mix in something evil. And that's why as a Christian, you've got to know your Bible because the devil will misquote it. And so many people are deceived because they see some truth in the religion, but they don't see where the poison is, where the danger is. So he commingles truth with error. 
Answer B, he, Jesus, was there in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights tempted. What else does the devil do? Tempted. Now, we're all tempted. It is not a sin to be tempted. We are all tempted probably many times a day. Some of you don't know you're tempted because you are not even trying to resist temptation. Do you know you do not feel the current in the river if you're drifting with the current? But as soon as you try to resist the current and swim upstream, you're going to feel the pressure. A lot of the world says, I don't get tempted. It's because they're doing everything the devil wants them to do. Reminds me of an evangelist named Billy Sunday. A man was coming to his evangelistic meetings, and Billy Sunday was preaching against sin. And finally, this man came stomping up to the evangelist and said, Pastor Sunday, will you stop rubbing the cat's fur the wrong way? He says, you keep rubbing the cat's fur the wrong way. And he said, no, I'm rubbing the cat's fur the right way. The cat needs to turn around. <laughs> and if we find out that we're going in God's direction, we're going to realize that we're getting resistance from the devil. Jesus was tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. You just don't want to give in to the temptation. Amen. It says in answer C, oh, I got to back up. Answer C, they are the spirits of demons performing signs. Can fallen angels perform signs and wonders and miracles? It says in Revelation that they can. Rasputin seemed to have some power. And there are wicked powers in high places that are often manipulating the leaders of the world. King Saul, before he died, he went to a witch and she conjured up an evil spirit that left him utterly discouraged. He committed suicide the next day. Armageddon, Revelation, tells us evil spirits come out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet to gather the kings, the leaders of the world together to that final battle. Evil spirits are going to be involved in deceiving through the devil and his angels. Answer D, he's called the accuser. Satan is always standing around accusing. Have you read the book of Job? He's up there in heaven saying, well, the only reason Job follows you is because you protected him. And you read in the book of Zechariah, the devil is pointing at the high priest Joshua and says, well, look at his dirty garments. He can't get into heaven looking like that. And when Michael comes to resurrect Moses, the devil's there and he says, ah, oh, Moses sinned before he died. You can't take him to heaven. And the devil is always accusing. The devil will tell you to sin and then he'll turn you in for doing it. Did you know that? Some people think that, well, you know, the devil tempted me to do this. I thought that all of a sudden I'd get some benefits if I sold my soul to him. Oh, no. He doesn't care about you. The devil's much more powerful than any of us. But the devil is not more powerful of you and God together. You and God are always a majority. Amen? You have nothing to be afraid of if you're linked up with Christ. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the son of David. And if you read in the Bible, David never lost a battle. Sometimes his army would retreat from him. There's one story where everyone left David except one soldier named Eliezer. I could never forget his name, Eliezer, the son of Dodo. <laughs> and everybody retreated, but David did not retreat, and he stood and he fought the Philistines with Eliezer, and the two of them defeated the army. If you are with Jesus, the son of David, you have nothing to fear. Amen. Because you'll pick up the sword of the Spirit and you'll win that battle. The accuser of our brethren will be cast down. He'll accuse them. By the way, people that are always gossiping and accusing other people, you're not doing the work of Jesus. You're doing the work of the devil. Answer E, he is a what? A murderer. He was the one who inspired Cain to kill his brother Abel. He has no regard for human life. Whether you're young or whether you're old or a baby, people say, why does God allow all this death? It breaks God's heart more than it does that of any human. This world has rebelled against God. The devil has claimed this world as his territory. But God so loved the world, he sent his son into this world to save as many as will come to him. And he will eventually, he's redeemed those who believe in him and he'll create a new heavens and a new earth, right? But right now there's a war in this world. And he's also a liar and the father of it. Question number six. When is the devil the most dangerous? Answer. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14. For Satan himself transforms himself into a what? 
an angel of light. You know, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and the devil came and said, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Do you think that the devil suddenly plopped down on the ground, he had bat wings and red leotards and a goatee and a horns and a pitchfork and said, I've got a proposition for you. Is that how he came to Jesus? No, he came as though he is a messenger from heaven. And the devil still does that. You know, I'm just going to be very honest with you. And Christianity is one of the most uh, scoffed at religions in the world because there are so many counterfeit Christians out there. But you do not counterfeit something that is not worthwhile. Have you ever seen somebody hold up a counterfeit $1 bill? You know, you give them a hundred dollar bill in the store, they'll hold it up to the line, they'll take a special pin and they'll look in the front, they'll look at the back. You ever see them do that with a penny? <laughs> Why? Not worth anything. But God's truth, God's church is the most valuable thing in the world. Amen. And the devil has created more counterfeits. And how many have surfed through the channels and you hear different preachers from different backgrounds and different perspectives and some of them, are, they're out there begging for money. And they're promising you the world if you'll send them money. And uh, you're wondering why it is they're flying around living like gods. And they're taking the money from people living on Social Security. That's the devil. Amen. Now, have you noticed this meeting? I'll make you a promise. We're not going to beg for your money. We're here, people have sponsored these meetings because they want to get the truth out. They believe Jesus is coming again. They want people to be saved. Amen? But don't believe everybody out there that says that uh, just because they quote a scripture or two, there's a lot of, Jesus warned us, there are wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul said, after my departure, I know that grievous wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, to draw away disciples after themselves to buy them their Bugatti and their fancy cars and their lifestyle. All in the name of the Lord, they do it. They're wolves. Amen? Does Satan know the Bible? Yeah. Just because somebody says, well, I've got the Bible or a pastor quotes from the Bible once or twice does not mean that they are following the Lord. We're putting the scriptures in your hands. We're saying you read it for yourself. Ask any question you can. In fact, you tell me something that we're not doing in this meeting that we can do to make it clear that these are scriptural presentations. We're doing everything we know how to do to get you to read the Bible for yourself and discover what the truth is. I'm not afraid of the truth, friends. I was up in a cave in the mountains, no religious preference at all. I started reading the Bible. I said, Lord, I want to know what is the truth. I started visiting different churches, and I also want to add there are a lot of good people in different denominations. There are good pastors in different denominations. They're not all shysters and con artists. We just know that there's some flim-flam pastors out there also, right? And so there's some good, sincere people, and I might respect with some of their disrespect, some of their doctrinal positions, but I said, Lord, there's so much confusion in Christianity, but I believe the teachings of Jesus. What is the truth? And up there in the mountains in a cave over 45 years ago, I prayed and said, Lord, I just want to know what is the truth. And the Lord revealed to me the things we're sharing with you in these meetings. And we want you to study and find it for yourself. Amen? Amen. Does the devil know the Bible? Better than anyone here. Probably got a photographic memory. He was the brightest of all the angels. When Jesus was meeting his temptations by saying, it is written, it is written, the devil went back, he says, I got to regroup. Okay, he wants to use the Bible, I'll use the Bible. And then the devil came to Jesus again, he said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from the temple. Do you know the devil goes to church? He took Jesus to church. Throw yourself down from the temple, for it is written. He will give his angels charge of you. And he began to misquote Psalm 91. The devil knows enough. He left out the part he'll give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. He says, throw yourself down. His angels will watch over you. But Jesus came back and said, you shall not tempt the name. You shall not tempt the Lord your God, quoting from Deuteronomy. So you need to know your Bible. 
so that if the devil has ministers that are misquoting or distorting or reading things out of context, you don't get to see, friends. Amen? The devil is an expert at quoting and misquoting the Bible for the purpose of deceiving people. That's why it's essential that God's people know the Scriptures for themselves. Some people think it's the pastor's job to read the Bible and tell us what it means. Oh, no, you get into a lot of trouble like that. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by what? How many of you need physical food every day? Jesus is saying you need to live by every word. You need spiritual food. And praise God, you live at a time where you can have a Bible on your shelf. You can listen to it in your car. You can read it on your phone. We, there's no excuse for us not to have the Bible. If you're blind, they've got it in Braille. I mean, everybody has access to the Word of God. So we're without excuse if we say, well, Lord, I didn't know. We may be destroyed for lack of knowledge because we didn't care to know. But we can know if we want to know what the truth is, friends. Number eight, whom on earth does the devil hate the most? Now we're back in Revelation. This is the last verse in Revelation chapter 12. The dragon. Who's the dragon? We already know that. Was wroth or enraged with the woman. Now that's a symbol. Did we talk about that yet? No. Who is the woman? The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loves the church. The Bible tells us, God says that the daughter of Zion is like a delicate and a comely woman, speaking of his people. All through the Bible, Hosea, he says, my, my people, my bride, have been unfaithful to me. So the dragon is wroth with the woman. But which woman? There's some counterfeit churches out there. And he makes war. This is the battle of Armageddon. With the rest of her offspring, this is talking about her seed, her descendants, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is the law and the prophets. The devil is especially threatened with God's people that have the law and the prophets. That's the word of God. They are not only reading the word, they're walking in the commandments of the Lord. They're being led by the spirit of prophecy, friends. God wants us to have his word and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's, you know, whoever this woman is, you want to be part of that woman. Why? Because the devil's mad at her. If, if you're making the devil happy, you're in the wrong place. You realize, friends, I hope I'm not scaring you, but in the last days, you're going to make someone mad. You just got to decide who it is. You're going to please and satisfy someone. Do you want to please the Lord and make the devil angry? Or do you want to please the devil and disappoint the Lord? You cannot have it both ways. Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. I would rather be on the winning team because I've read the last chapter. I know who wins. Amen? Amen. All right. The dragon is wroth with the woman, keeps the commandments of God. Last prophecy in the Old Testament. Remember the law of Moses. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet. The law and the prophets. God's people have the word of God. Question number nine. What two deadly animals does the Bible use to portray Satan? You can read here in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the word Satan means actually adversary, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. So he's compared in one place to a lion. And a lion uses stealth. You know, a male lion will even eat its own cubs. The females must protect the cubs from the male lion. And... Uh, the male lions actually don't do most of the hunting. The females do. The male lion, he'll go out upwind from where the zebra or the wildebeest are. And he'll take a chest full of air. He'll step out of the grass. He'll roar. He'll make sure they all see him. And then the animals run into the mouths of the females that are hiding in the other direction. The devil will try to get you looking this way. And you run that way. And that's exactly where he wanted you to run. I'm surprised how many people think the mark of the beast is a tattoo. It doesn't say that in the Bible. Some versions even translate, and he causes everyone to get a tattoo. Do you really think the devil is that dumb? That in the last days he's going to tell everybody to line up and someone's going to have a big old, you know, stamp, and he's going to come out, we're going to put, you go, 666, six, six. you don't mind, do you? You're just forehead of the hand, just trust us. It'll be okay. That's what some people are waiting for. 
Now, I'm not getting 666 stamped on my forehead. I'll be okay. The devil wants people to be deceived, so they're walking into the deception, walking away from the trick. He's a deceiver. Not only is he like a lion, the Bible says that he is like a serpent. That great dragon cast out the what? The serpent of old, called the devil and Satan. Why a serpent? What was the first animal that the devil used as a medium to deceive our parents? It was the serpent that spoke to Eve. He said, oh, I've been eating this fruit. I know God said don't eat it, but look what the fruit did for me. I can talk. And if you eat it, you'll be like God. What did the devil want? To be like God. And he implanted his own desires in our first parents. And ever since then, our DNA has been messed up with sin. But Jesus came to make us new creatures. Jesus came as the second Adam. And just like the first Adam fell, the second Adam overcame, and we can be overcomers through Christ. A little amazing fact. You know, there's an island not far from Sao Paulo, Brazil. They call it Snake Island. And on that island, they've got so many snakes because they eat the seabirds. There's one snake per square yard. Nobody's allowed to go to that island because among the snakes, they've got the lancehead pit viper that 90% of the deaths in Brazil are from this one snake. It'll kill you right away. Devils are... The snakes, rather, are cold-blooded. The devil is cold-blooded. He does not care. He's got venom. But you know the good news, friends? Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. Why did Jesus say that? The children of Israel were being killed by a plague of venomous serpents. Shepherds used to carry staffs. I lived in the mountains in the desert, and I had a snake stick. And I didn't reach out and just kill the snake with my hands. I killed it with a stick. And then you don't pick it up because you think they're dead, and they're not. They'll turn around and bite you. And you don't want to step on the skeleton of a dead snake because even the venom can still pierce your skin with the dead fangs. So when you kill a snake, you pick it up, and you carry it off out of the way of population, off the trail, and you bury it. And the Hebrews knew a snake up on a pole meant a defeated serpent. And Jesus, when he went up on the cross, through his blood that was spilt, he provided the anti-venom for the disease of sin. And he is offering you a blood transfusion so that you can be saved from the power of sin. And some people think, I've tried. I don't know how it's possible. But through Christ, all things are possible. And I've not told you my story, but I was drinking and smoking and using drugs, a thief, living immorally, and Jesus came into my life, and he changed me. And he can give you victory, and he can change you. He can break the chains and set you free. Number 10. Well, it's the only way that we can resist Satan. The Bible says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Do you realize every night that you tune into these meetings or you come to this seminar, you are drawing near to God. What does God promise? I will draw near to you. I hope you sense he's drawing near to you right now, friends. And he will, and, but you resist the devil. The devil's going to say, oh, traffic's too much tonight. <laughs> Please come back Tuesday night. <laughs> We still got some room left. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you when you're tempted. And as you resist, God's power comes into your life, friends. Number 11, how did Jesus fight the assaults of the devil? You read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for, say it with me, it is written. Friends, there is power in the Word of God that sets us free. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. When David went out against the giant, and we all face giants of temptation, he went out with a stone. You know, the stone is a symbol of the Word. Jesus said, these words that I speak to you, 
If you're wise men, you will build on the rock. And David killed Goliath. He didn't actually kill him yet. He knocked him out with a rock. Knocked him unconscious. It sank into his forehead. He fell on his face. Then David went over and he pulled out his sword. And he decapitated the giant. You know, you kill a snake, cut off its head. And when the devil comes to you with temptation, you pull out the sword of the Spirit. The Bible says, Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin. And when you're tempted to be discouraged, you quote the promises. God has not given us the spirit of fear. God has given us courage. God told Joshua, be courageous, be courageous, be very courageous. When you're tempted to be afraid, Jesus is my peace I give unto you. Paul says, I give you peace that passes understanding. When you think I'm not going to make it, the Bible says he's exceedingly abundantly above, able to do all that we could ask or think. And you have these promises of God and they will inspire you. And this is not, this is not some kind of biblical voodoo, friends. This is real. The power of the word changes us. You claim those promises by faith and you get the victory. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand. Friends, you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Jesus wants us to resist the devil. Number 12, here's a good part. What will be the final fate of Satan and his angels? Are we going to be tempted through eternity? Are we always going to be battling against, against evil? Isaiah 14, 15, it says, You will be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. He wanted the position of God, the highest. He's going to be the lowest. And Jesus, who took the lowest position, who humbled himself, will be exalted and his name will be above every name. If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. If you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. The devil's principal problem was pride. Jesus is motivated by love, meekness, humility. Take my yoke upon you, he says. Learn of me. You will find rest unto your souls. Matthew 11. Matthew 25, verse 41 He'll say to those on the left hand, this is the parable of Jesus, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire. Now, did God prepare that fire for you and me, or who is it really prepared for? The devil and his angels. But if you follow the devil and his angels, you get the same reward. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, what it means here by everlasting fire is what that fire does is permanent. The devil's not coming back. The result of that fire is forever. And those that go to that fire, no resurrection from that, friends. It's called the second death in Revelation. God is offering you life. This time, this life is your chance. This life is your probation. It's appointed unto man once to die, after that the judgment. Don't think, well, I'll change my mind later in my next life when I'm reincarnated. Oh, no, no. You've got one life, friends. Amen? Now is your time. Today is the acceptable time. Don't follow the devil into his doom. The devil who deceived them was cast into the what? The lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And he is going to be destroyed. The Bible describes his punishment as the second death from which there is no resurrection. There's no parole. Ultimately, the devil and his angels and all the wicked will be consumed in these eternal flames. It's the result of the fire is eternal. Again, you can read in Ezekiel 28, 18, I brought forth a fire from the midst of you, and it does what? It devours you. And I turn you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. In the final judgment, you can read about this in Revelation chapter 20. Satan is going to make one final attempt. We have a whole lesson on it. To rally the forces of evil against God. And the Bible says that God demonstrates to the whole universe the devil is beyond repentance. He's not going to change. Don't wait for the devil to repent. God has no choice. He used to be the highest of the angels, but he is going to be destroyed. And God promises he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. You have become a horror and you shall be no more forever. That's what it says about the devil. Some have wondered, I even saw a question, how do we know that someone else in the future is not going to question God's love? 
Because what the devil did in this terrible experiment in this world will be a reminder through all eternity Jesus will have the scars in his hands, friends, for all eternity. Didn't he have them at the resurrection? The only thing in heaven made by man are the scars in the Savior's hands. And it's going to be there forever to remind us that I'm never going to doubt God's love. I'm never going to question his goodness. And what the devil did will never happen again. We can look on into eternity with perfect peace and confidence that it will not rise up again a second time. How does God feel about the destruction of the wicked, this final destruction? God doesn't want anyone to perish. Listen to the words of the Lord pleading with you. As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the wicked turn. Jesus died for sinners. He loves the lost. He wants to save them. But that the wicked, that they turn, turn from your evil way and live. Turn, says the Lord, for why will you die? God wants us to be saved, each one of us, friends. Do you know that Jesus has provided the venom? He's provided the anti-venom, I should say, for the devil's uh, disease, for the bite of the serpent. He can save you from sin. Whatever your sins are, he loves you. He died for you while you're sinners. He wants to save the wicked. How many of you believe that? And you want to be saved. Can I pray with you tonight, you who are watching? Loving Lord, I pray that we'll take the things we've learned now and realize that the only way to survive what's going on in this world is to put our lives in Jesus' hands, to trust him to save us, to cleanse us and make us new creatures. We believe in it and ask for it now, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. That's our prayer. Now, when's our next study? Don't miss this. We're going to be talking about the law and the lamb. It's one of the most important studies in the series. You will be sorry if you miss it. Come, bring your friends. God bless you, friends. We'll see you again Tuesday night. Thank you.